great pleasure to introduce Professor Laura Nader, who is a professor of anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley, where she has been teaching since 1960. Just a few years ago, she celebrated 50 years of teaching at Berkeley. Now, this is, of course, significant in many ways. Um, for example, she was the first woman to receive a tenure-track job in anthropology there. And then 33 years later, she was the first professor to teach anthropology to a certain freshman from Southern California, who would later go on to become an assistant professor at Yale. That's me. Um, so here's the reader from Anthro 3, um, which I keep in my office. And I look, as I'm trying to teach introduction to Anthro here, I sometimes turn to Anthro 3. And that was the spring of 1993, Wheeler Auditorium. And it keeps me inspired to this day. But in my mind, Dr. Nader's long commitment to teaching anthropology at Berkeley is most significant because she reminds Berkeley what it means to be Berkeley. Not a brand, not a logo, not a passing theoretical fad, but an attitude. A deeply anthropological attitude of critique, an intellectual daring which is forged from a willingness to speak out and to ask straightforward, direct, simple, yet always penetrating questions, even if those questions risk ruffling a few feathers. In an age when academic anthropology has increasingly been reduced to a career choice or, an over or has become over-professionalized, Dr. Nader shows what it means to live an anthropological life, which is, at heart, a life of questioning the world we live in. She had a way of thinking that she introduced to us students at Berkeley a way which I'll never forget, in which I teach my introduction to anthropology classes today, which is the idea that anthropologists should be interested in those things which make their antennae go up. And she would always say this in class, that made my antennae go up. <laughs> that is, they should always be ready to be roused into curiosity by strange features of social life, by inequalities, injustices, dogmas, ideologies. As an anthropologist, when your antennae go up, you start to ask questions, you conduct research, you challenge assumptions. Today, as the American public university system is increasingly under threat, Dr. Nader also brings a sense of history which enables her to remind us all precisely what a great public university can look like. And she refuses to watch the dismantling of that system without a fight. From the top down, she has been demanding accountability from university budget offices, protesting the corporatization of the university, and asking for leaders to respond to their faculty. Even in the high-rolling 1990s when I was a student there, when no one seemed to notice anything but how many new cafes were appearing next to the libraries, she was always already sounding alarms about the selling of the university to the highest bidder. Did you know that the Museum of Anthropology at Berkeley is really called the Robert Lowy Museum? a fact which is buried under the avalanche of Hearst family dollars that bought the name. Did you know that there was a time when engineering buildings on public university campuses were not named after the same engineering firms that compelled those universities to provide them free job training? From the bottom up, she has also been an inspiration to generations of Berkeley students, reminding them that it's okay to be passionate about the world, about one's education, and that it's not just okay to rock the boat and challenge received wisdom, but that it's part of one's civic duty to do so. Now, she doesn't hand out trophies to students, but she pushes them through prickly and provocative instigation. In the late 1990s, when I was a student there, for example, she had the guts to boldly walk into a classroom and ask Berkeley students why they had all become lobotomized. <laughs> we all nodded in approved unison, only to recognize that by nodding we were proving her point. We quickly learned that thoughtful minds should resist the seduction of agreeing about everything. This is the danger of what she famously called harmony ideology, where calm consensus and smooth tranquility come at the expense of real civic debate, disagreement, and agitation for social justice. We, some have called her paranoid, untrusting, in response, she reminds us that the opposite of paranoia is even worse, trustanoia. The fact that we don't have a word like trustanoia says a lot about the central dogmas in our society, the bounds of 
the bounds of thinkable thought. And challenging central dogmas and unraveling assumptions is at the center of Laura Nader's anthropological life, which is not just a career, but I would say it's a calling. Today, I look forward to learning more about the central dogmas that prevent us from thinking critically about energy. This talk and her visit today have been made possible by many Yale organizations, including the Climate and Energy Institute, the Department of Anthropology, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Center for Latin American and Iberian Studies, the Whitney Humanities Center, and the Frank Program in Humanities and, S and Sciences. I think just that number of organizations shows how many, how many different intellectual lines of inquiry her work speaks to. But special thanks go to the graduate students in our program who organized this visit, especially Chris Hebden, who's been organizing this visit in the same week that he's preparing for his quals exams, and also Sadie Randall, who's been helping him as well. So with no, with no further ado, I'd like to have you please join me in welcoming Professor Laura Nader. And the title of her talk today is Energy and Human Frailty. time for anthropology. Terribly needed in this world today. We're a generalist field, like the ecologists. We're not just specialists, but anthropology, remember, is greater than what anthropologists are doing today. There's so much specialization worldwide among elites that they don't understand the problems of coordination and it results with the technology and what I call the fried brains problem. The inability to connect the dots. That's what you're supposed to learn to do in anthropology. Connect the dots. These are critical times because of our technologies. Because of what humans have participated in the development of what's happening on the planet. And we desperately need coordination. We cannot just think that technology is going to save us. And all you need to do is look and see what happened in um, LAX uh, when the man came in with the, to shoot him up. Nothing coordinated. They've just done a review of that. They have all the technology to immediately have somebody on the spot. took over 10 minutes. And you could name a number of issues like that. So think about what I have to say today with me and in that context of the need for scope. Sherry Washburn, the physical anthropologist in our department many years ago, said he wanted students to have a specialty, to be able to teach the introductory course in anthropology across the field, integrated anthropology course, and he wanted us to think about new questions for the future. Think about whether you do those three things, which require specialization, scope for what the field is, and where the field should be heading. <coughs> now, today I want to deal with energy, science, and scientists. And I have a talk that I have written up, partly because I want to get a lot in. And how much time do I have, Eric? That would be Chris. 50 minutes? 50 minutes. 50 minutes. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, energy, science, and scientists. And I've been working on this since the 1970s when very few people were. I was invited by the National Academy of Sciences to come and participate in a conference on breeder reactors. It was a big project. And I told them that they had the wrong major. And my siblings are both working on energy, I have no clue. But the guy on the other end of the line said, are you the anthropologist? And I said, yes. He said, we need an anthropologist. So I went on board knowing nothing about energy, but, and knowing not a lot about the scientists I was going to be dealing with. There were three number of people, 299 males, one anthropologist, a few sociologists, historians, but most of them were physicists or engineers. So, now, since the 1970s, there are a lot of anthropologists now zeroing in on energy studies. And you look and see what they're doing. And they're, one specializes in oil, that's okay, coal, working on coal, working on nuclear, perhaps, and so on. But I think there are very few, I may be the only one working on the experts. And when I was with these group of 300 
299 experts. Uh, I, at one point, I realized uh, that when there are men in groups, or like primates, they vie with each other. <laughs> and so I said, you know, is there any reason why we can't have any more women in this organization, this group? Because it lasted five, five years. And uh, I said, do you think I enjoy being the only woman in this group? And they said, you seem to be handling it very well, Laura. And it was interesting, because they never added any women. But when I was invited to an all-male conference in Damascus, and I said the same thing, uh, I would prefer not to come to an all-male conference, they invited 20 women, 20 scientists. So there's really, it was weird watching these guys vying with one another. And I was taking notes. And they say, are you studying up for? And I said, of course. <laughs> and they laughed. Little did they know. <laughs> so, so I am one of the few anthropologists dealing with energy science and scientists and the militarization of these people who are deeply embedded in corporate. Now in thinking about the specific science question in human frailty, I decided to go look at some earlier material. I went back to a book that was given to us when we were graduate students at Harvard. And it was a book, Wintergrand Conference, on uh, man's role in changing the face of the planet, 1955. It was really an, ama it's an amazing book. For those of you who are interested in these issues, you ought to get a copy of, you know, a second-hand copy or something. This is before the concept of Anthropocene was popularized by Nobel laureates and so on, recognizing that humans were the key drivers of the Earth system. And it was a challenge to those who claimed that energy solutions are purely technological. Anybody who tells you that the solution to our energy problems are technological, they don't know what they're talking about whether they're social scientists or physics, physics, physicists or engineers that say that. And I'll tell you why. In 55, uh, there was an ecologist in this conference, and he put it this way toward the end. I have become increasingly doubtful about the science utility as a tool for solving all human problems. I have been distressed at finding some of us here talking as though we regarded science as sort of a white magic and answer to all problems, a direct road to truth, objective, factual, certain. But the scientist can never attain any absolute objectivity since he must also deal with the mind of the observer. The sciences and the humanities form a false dichotomy because science is one of the humanities. He ends by clarifying that man requires science and technology for survival, but for science to survive it needs to be humanized. He says, perhaps our Western world so proud of its technical advantages, is starting a sort of process of suicide through its failure to assimilate science into its general culture or as a curious consequence of the scientist's own self-important attitude. Those are really strong words. All right. Then I went to a publication <coughs> by nuclear physicist Jose Goldenberg from Brazil, I've met him in Hawaii, and he put out a book called World Energy Assessment, Energy and the Challenge of Sustainability. This was initiated by four scientists from four continents, Brazil, Sweden, India, and the United States. And at the beginning, their approach was so much at odds with their colleagues that they thought they were thought of as maverick visionaries. Their position was noted in the following, this is what they said. And tell me if this doesn't sound like anthropology. The achievement of sustainable development dictates a global perspective, a very long time horizon, and immediate policy measures that take into account the long lead time needed to change the system. The implications for the way science is practiced is made clear. It cannot be business as usual. Then I went to Another book, by, edited by McNeish and Logan, it's called Flammable Societies, Studies on the Socioeconomics of Oil and Gas. And when they concluded, the editors quoted from Pierre Bourdieu the following, Neoliberalism is a political program disguised as science to increase 
the economic power of the few. Think about that. Goldenberg et al. were calling for a long time horizon to include what happened after the discovery of agriculture and after the rise of Western industrialism. Anthropology. That's what it was. Now the final read came in the form of reading my alumni journal from Harvard. And it was a review of a new book by a woman named Elaine Scarry. How many of you know her or have heard of her? Elaine Scarry. She's written a book called Thermonuclear Monarchy, Choosing Between Democracy and Doom. She's a professor of aesthetics and value at Harvard, and she has pointed, nuclear weapons undo anything that could be meant by democracy. We have a choice, get rid of nuclear weapons or get rid of Congress and the citizens. We got rid of Congress and the citizens. She's pointing to the concentration of outside outsized violent force in the hands of the American president that has largely undermined our three-point point form of government that the framers of the Constitution had created. One man elected by a minority of the world's people and a minority of Americans, since so many Americans don't even vote, can destroy the earth wherever he or she goes, the suitcase goes with him. And that's the nuclear bomb. How many of you have ever seen the day after Trinity? One person. That's all? Nobody else has seen it? You want to understand something about how science operates and human Fred to go look at it. It was made by Humanities Foundation Grant in California. And uh, it basically talks about how the bomb was made and how the scientists themselves could not stop the making of the bomb, even though they had qualms. They were in a flow, and they couldn't stop. They had to see if the gadget worked, as they called it. They knew that it was going to be used on Japan. They had left two cities unbombed so that it could be a good experiment. Afterwards, they, in this film, they interviewed some of the people that were involved, one of whom was Oppenheimer's brother, and they said, what were you thinking? He said, when the bomb went off, he said, first, I was glad it worked. Then I thought, oh my God, there are people. Human frailty. Now, science is one of those contemporary activities we take for granted as natural, something that's always going to be there. Um, medieval historian of science, Lynn White, reminds us that it's not necessarily a permanent thing, science, as we know. That the Romans were creative and originally, but there was no ancient Roman science, even though they knew about Greek science. In the case of Islamic science, roughly covering 750 to 1150 AD, Islam was a leader in scientific activity, but by the 11th century, the whole focus of Islamic culture shifted and science was deliberately abandoned. In relation to Christianity, science had also had a varied history. There was a time when only spiritual values had significance, and Lynn White also called for an increasing awareness on the part of sciences of the relation of science activity to the total human context because, in quotes, our modern habit of regarding scientific progress as inevitable may in fact be dangerous to its continuing vigor. No faith can afford to, re be re to remain unexamined, especially faith in the science and technology which is shaping our lives. We know from other contexts that true believers can have a pernicious effect on the quality of freedom and the tolerance for diversity. In relation to science and technology, there are believers among those who do science and technology and those who consume this work in the form of ideas and material goods, etc. The processes of control that have triggered a critical response both inside and outside the community are related to different clusters of beliefs and there is building steam in universities throughout the Western world dealing with the issue of science as ideology and science and technology 
as anti-democratic, which is what Elaine Scarry's point is. Some speculate that these concerns arise because of the problems inherent in science, but not because of the problems inherent, but because of a particular kind of science that has evolved in context of the militarization of American science. NSF was militarily oriented. That's how it came into being. So what follows here, a few comments about uh, what influences science, the construction of a science and technology energy culture. One that has hubris and very little humility, and a growing detachment from the broad human context. A little history. 1981, shortly after this National Academy work that I did, I was invited by the Miter Corporation to give a talk on um, whatever I wanted. And I called it Barriers to Thinking New About Energy. It was the most sought after talk they published it. It was republished in Physics Today, republished in Chemtech, and more recently republished in The Industrial Physicist. I think very few anthropologists have probably read it. Anybody in this room ever read it in physics today? Oh, that's impressive. Barriers to think about, knew about energy, was a commentary on the mindsets that I encountered among the physicists, chemists, and engineers with whom I was working. The piece generated a lively response from the scientific community. And I'll refer to one that came from a Nobel laureate at Harvard. He describes the changing intellectual climate in Western science. He says, yes, that's the way it is. The well-guided and well-guided by an inexpressed system of rewards and punishment. In the first half of this century, we had a generation of monumental physicists, Einstein, Bohr, Eisenberg, Pauli, Schrodinger, all of whom knew that what physics is about is reality, and that physics, science, can explore only part of reality and by far the smaller part. That kind of thought, he ended, is now virtually forbidden in the scientific literature. How can thought be forbidden in the scientific literature? A second letter begins to answer that question. This guy is at the Berkeley Livermore, the, the Berkeley National Lab. He says, I noticed over the years an irrationality on the part of many colleagues when it comes to discussing matters relating to energy. All the data in the world cannot bring about change in energy strategies once the person has decided on a particular course. This is all the more strange as many people, these people are competent, intelligent scientists who usually alter their views in the light of new data, like Fukushima, for example. I've heard about energy policy, uh, but the disagreements are really disagreements over values, and scientists don't know how to deal with values. They feel uncomfortable. The inability to recognize the source of the conflict leads to the nonsensical and ridiculous statements you mentioned in your comment. Now, if you summarize the mindsets that I encountered in looking at these people, I would say the following. People who thought differently were told they were off the track. They kept saying, you're off the track, Laura. And I'd say, if we knew where the track was, we wouldn't be here. <coughs> There was a lack of respect for diverse solutions. There was a lack of respect for different kinds of intelligence. There was an avoidance of discussing technologies other than nuclear or coal. Abstract rather than concrete thinking led to the problem. If, for, if you figure out how to dispose of nuclear waste, or you think you can ensure safety, that's as good as doing it. It's really amazing. If they've got it on paper, they can do it, then they know they can do it. Never mind that they don't do it. Memos uh, discuss nuclear, coal, and non-nuclear, and non-nuclear was solar. And upon different occasions was described as an orphan child, not very intellectually challenging, just a bunch of mirrors. My notebook was full of observations, such as, in their lexicon, change means maintaining the status quo. Progress is equal to growth. GNP is equal to increased human welfare. Energy growth means more economic growth. More energy expenditure does not change lifestyle, while less does. Societies only change from the top down. 
technological fixes can solve human problems and forestall crises. In addition to these beliefs, which although unsubstantiated by evidence, were powerful driving forces, I asked specific questions such as, how could you go ahead with nuclear without having solved a nuclear waste problem? And I heard, because it's fun, it's interesting, it's fascinating. Even though the same people would unselfconsciously agree that such a direction might be dangerous. I tried to understand the mindset that could say, yes, the, big, the, hole, the boat has a big hole in it, but we'll take care of it later. This was all after Thomas Kuhn had written his blockbuster on the structure of scientific revolution. Consequence thinking is absence. Don't expect the scientists to be leaders. No skin in the game. You know what that means? No skin in the game? They can do, they have done whatever they want to do. They're not responsible. Who's responsible for nuclear warheads? Wasn't passed by Congress? Wasn't okay by the citizen? And the people in the military who pushed it? They're not responsible. I began to notice that they talked about human beings in a strange way. They'd say, well, if we have a nuclear accident, we lose 2% of the population. Only 2%. And I would say, I refuse to be in a room with people who talk about human beings in terms of percentages. How many people are 2%? It would be very uncomfortable. What they were doing is distancing themselves from the consequence mm -hmm. of their work. Distancing. So for all the bravo about quantitative work, you have to understand that it also has this function of distance. <clears throat> so the assumptions that were made about happiness uh, and quality of life and so forth and increased energy were just not evidentially based. Between 1935 and 55, you had more energy and you had better quotes quality of life measure. But between 55 and 75, you didn't. So there's no necessary correlation to be found there, although they always say the quality of life, we need all of this energy. So it was really bad science that I was part, partly witnessing. Now the book that we put out, the National Academy, was called Energy Choices in a Democratic Society. We were concerned with what kinds of energy technologies are compatible with a democracy. And that question is bothersome to people. Because what do you mean? I mean, we need the energy, the industrial process and so on. But no, we're a democracy. There's certain technologies that don't go well with democracy. Like what? Nuclear. Why? Nuclear has to be monitored. It's dangerous. It's not voted on. The waste problem, you just list all the problems. The tendency uh, between the conflicts between efficiency and democratic ideology between defining complex problems as technical and resolvable by expertise, the idea of citizen participation, all of these we chose to disaggregate in our study, Energy Choices in Democratic Society. We described two future scenarios, one in which you had high efficiency and the other low use and high technology. So we said you can have more, more efficiency and lots of technology if you like it, but you don't need to have more energy use. The high energy productivity scenario was designed to explore the use of energy in a society that looks very much like our own, uh, but projected into the future without major changing in attitudes. Or we explored a society in which attitudes towards resources change, a society that's decentralized and people with people who value thrift and self-reliance a nation that's not vulnerable to terrorism and violence and so on. We were decoupling, illustrating the possibilities. It's not inevitable. The inevitability syndrome is very powerful. It has to go in that direction. You can't stop it. It's now going. We have to see if the, if the, if the, if the gadget will work. The inevitability syndrome drives a lot of this stuff, and that's why the experts need the generalists to say, wait a minute. I can give you 10 examples of where it's not necessarily so. Okay, what was the reaction to energy choices 
in a democratic society. It was denial. We were against progress. We were describing impossible futures. We were planning future worlds that go against the grain of human nature. Now these are scientists saying that. What do they know about human nature? Right? What do they know about any of the things they're talking about? Much of what we thought was possible for the year 2010 happened before the report was published. And actually they didn't want to publish even the final report. Because they kept sending it back. This was a sixth revision. You really have to, you have to just decide when you're in a situation like that, I'm going to stay with it to the end to see how this story ends. And the sixth revision, he said, well, you know, our, well, first they said, you know, we need less, less prose, more, more, more chart, more, what did they say, more charts, quantitative. And I said, how can you talk about love? How can you talk about happiness? How can you talk about all these things we value in numbers? And then they'd write back and say, more charts, less prose, these guys don't read. So we had an illiteracy problem among our smartest experts. These guys don't read. Another reaction, quite well, the same reaction, was to impugn our methodology. We weren't quantitative enough, enough but they wanted more tables and so forth. And John Holdren calls this the illusory precision. Illusory precision. A sense of concrete reality where there is none. And much that's important is left out, like the things I talked about, civil rights, freedom, democracy, quality of life, and so forth. The problem of mindset is discussed a lot today in connection with concern over creativity in American science and technology. If you live in California, all you hear about innovation, creative, Americans have to learn about creative innovation. When you see people talking that much about creativity and innovation, you know that there's a lack of it. Just look at Silicon Valley, a bunch of techno twits <laughs> who are making lots of money doing dumb things like Google Glass, bragging about you know, self-driving cars, never mentioning mass transportation problems in our country, spending lots of money and getting patted on the back for doing it. And bragging. They brag a lot. Google glasses. <laughs> when I watched, I went to a place where they were showing off the Google glasses, and I went up to the guy and I said, what does it do? He said, oh, he said, let me tell you, what do you want to know? I said, I went to my first computer conference in 1963 in Lake Arrowhead, California. Can you find it? Because Chris had already found it for me. It's all, all online. That was my first conference on computers, and that's where I decided not to do it. We predicted Snowden, etc. And uh, he said, okay, I can do it. <laughs> if I had more time, I could find it. I said, I know you can't. Tell me, what does it do to the eyes? Oh, he said, the eyes get used to it. I said, no, what does it do to the biology of the eyes? never thought of that. <laughs> Google Glasses. Try driving with Google Glasses. It's worse than cell phones, which they're beginning to do about it. So the whole business of, of uh, what we, these mindsets and need for, uh, is something that, that is pulling science and engineers one way or the other because of their loyalties to the organization that pays their salaries. Now, this is important. A few of these people speak up, but others remain silent, even on questions of science finding, because if you do open your mouth, dissent is punished. At one level, there is awareness of censorship. Both American and European physicists who corresponded with me identified with the groupthink problem, or what one person described as the mind cage, and many made specific reference to censorship in our national laboratories. To say that dissenting scientists are harshly punished brings to mind the cases of Soviet scientists who protested the totalitarian regime. American scientists have often supported the cause of scientists who are punished for dissent in other countries. Yet when an American scientist is punished for dissent, there is not comparable protest. These scientists work 
who work in organizations that punish dissent and are never heard about. I have a sibling who worked at Oak Ridge, and I had my husband worked at Lawrence Berkeley. So we know I know a little bit about how this dissent question works. But the exception, an interesting case of public uh, revelation is Goffman Tampa. Any of you ever hear of Goffman Tampa? They were two physicists who in the fall of 1969 revealed their findings on low-level radiation and they asked the Atomic Energy Commission to increase the margin of safety by lowering the permissible radiation dose. The country was beginning to move ahead with the construction of nuclear power plants, had mostly heard about the friendly atom and energy too cheap to meter. It was therefore strange to hear a report on radiation risks. Pure propaganda. Goffman Tamplin had extrapolated from the Hiroshima and Nagasaki data, and there were American physical anthropologists who worked on that issue as well, uh, in order to estimate the effects of the radiation emissions following the federal radiation standards of the cancer and leukemia cases that would be caused. They expected their data to be examined and maybe refuted, but a public debate was launched and they were fighting for their jobs. The scientists working with them were reassigned, the budgets were reduced, travel allowances were cut, and with each act a degradation accompanied personal attacks on their integrity, professional integrity. What was most instructive about this story, however, was not a single scientist, either at the Livermore lab or any other national lab, stood up to defend them. They would have done it for the Soviet scientists. They didn't do it for the American scientists. I think it needs to be pointed out that the scientists' workplace in national labs is different from university departments. They have no tenure protection and, until recently, no due process. I worked with a group of scientists and lawyers and so forth, faculty at the university, for eight of us for about eight years, trying to get scientific freedom for the scientists that work at the lab, written into the contract. Because without scientific freedom, they can discover all they want and they can't say. And if you can't say it to the public, that's why the whole question of science in a democratic society becomes important. It was James Bryant Conant, 1951, president of Harvard, who said that decay in science sets in with repression. And he plead, pleaded for the importance of absolutely untrammeled discussion and debate, which was not being heeded by large-scale labs. The intimidation sometimes is so powerful that to argue that labs ought to be democratized or that scientists ought to be able to dissent is received with hostility even today. And when we weren't able to do what we wanted to do to give academic freedom to the scientists in the labs, we then per pursued the argument that the University of California should detach from the labs. Because if they can't have scientific freedom, and they're going to be run by corporations, then we don't, want, then we don't want them using the reputation of the university to make it seem like they did have freedom. Now, these national labs were started by military forces during World War II, before and during, and job security is only one of the pressures. There are other controls that stem from the belief that only a specialist in the subject should ask questions. Scientists can, uh, uh, on top, can tell those below what to do, just like in the military. A theoretical physicist told me he didn't ask questions about nuclear energy because it was not his field. So she gets narrower and narrower. It's not only you have to be a scientist or you have to be a physicist, you have to be a nuclear scientist to you know, check. So then objectivity becomes shared subjectivity. And group think reactions lead one to question what experts are practicing science and when they are practicing magic or religion. Now, some time ago, I attended this meeting of breeder reactor scientists, and I went with the linguist, Mickey Foster. I didn't trust myself by that time. And one scientist observed in our presence that what anthropologists do is philosophy, not science. Philosophy, another volunteer, is when you can't quantify and when results are based on opinion, as if their results aren't based on opinion. Too cheap to meet it? Are you kidding? They proceeded with the following exchange. Jack says to Bill, Bill, I like your numbers. They agree with mine. Bill beams and says, how about Jim? Has Jim generated any numbers yet? 
Jack says, no, why don't you send your numbers over before he gets ego involved in generating his own. Objective, quantifying. Again, what scientists say when they're guaranteed anonymity is straightforward. A chairman of a physics department said the following, the price of questioning or dissent can result in professional ostracism. The nuclear scientists observed those of us who would seriously question the scientific goals of our peers face an ultimate blacklist from our profession by the entrenched establishment. Unbeknownst to the general public, the leading physical scientists are not Einstein-like characters, but more likely intelligent bureaucrats intent on building or maintaining their empires. So if we were going to examine science with the objectivity and detachment that we need, then we would have to conclude that only part of what scientists do is scientific. Which is why in my Naked Science book I ask the question, when is science scientific? When do they follow their own, their own uh, rules? Demystifying science is often done by great scientists. So, uh, if you've ever heard of Erwin Schrodinger, um, an Austrian theoretical physicist, he asked, how true is it that science furnishes us with a body of truth which is objective and stable, unmolded by human temperament, human temperament. And in answering the question, Schrodinger puts that exact sciences in quotes. He says, a selection has been made in choosing the raw material on which the present structure of science is built. That selection must have been influenced by circumstances other than scientific. Thus far, physical science cannot claim to be independent of its environment. And so if we go back through an indefinite series of stages in scientific advance, we finally come to the first conscious attempt of primitive man to understand and form a logical mental picture of events observed in the world about it. And then he talks about primitive man who formed for himself his scientific constructed mental from the surrounding necessity of bodily sustenance. Now who could he have been influenced by? in anthropology, Schrodinger. Who has written about this in anthropology? Anybody? Who wrote about magic, science, and religion? Huh? Malinowski. No, Malinowski wrote a book called Magic, Science, and Religion. Maybe the Greeks too, but that Schrodinger uh, was influenced by. So what Malinowski did was, he, uh, he wrote it in a very public manner, public anthropology manner, because he wanted this to be, he did it sort of implicitly. And later on, Leach said, he just should have said, this applies to American labs as well as it applies to, you know, the, 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 the Trobrianders. He said um, the Trobrianders fish easily in the inner lagoons where abundant fish can be found without danger and uncertainty, in contrast with the open and dangerous seas where the yield vary, he said. In the lagoon fishing, where man can rely upon his knowledge and skill, magic does not exist. While in the open sea fishing, full of danger and uncertainty, there is extensive magical ritual to ensure secure safety and good results. Well, when they developed nuclear, they had no idea. They had no experience. They couldn't predict. It was partly magic. It was wishful thinking. Too cheap to meet it, right? And all the other things that they sold to us. And we bought. And even after Fukushima, Obama okayed the development of new nuclear plants in the United States, although we haven't had any new ones since the 70s. How do you explain that? That is so bizarre. I mean, you need some imaginative anthropologist to put an explanation on that. How could you go after Fukushima? How could the Japanese vote in a pro-nuclear leadership after Fukushima. But the Prime Minister, who was lied to by Temko, he now flipped. He never again will he pursue nuclear. He's, he's, he's sanity. So then you have to begin to explain this. And of course some people explain it because the Japanese want to have readers because they never forgot Nagasaki and Hiroshima. If you think that's just in their past, just think again. They want to have the wherewithal to make a nuclear weapon if they have to. 
And I read in the New York Times, Sunday New York Times, that the U.S. is now bringing back some of the materials. Uh, so they can. But, uh, I mean, that's the whole issue with, with uh, Iran. Pointing the fingers at Iran could have all the love. And there in the Middle East, you've got Israel with nuclear weapons. <laughs> There's nothing rational about these decisions that are being made. And they're, they're interwoven with human frailty. Now, um, in the Trobrianders, the whole society shared the understanding of risk and uncertainty. And one of the dangers of modern science is that magic and religion in science are not distinguished by the main actors as they are among the Trobrianders. Science is being practiced as ideology. As the Nobel laureate lamented, the scientists of today are not of the generation of the Einsteins, the Schrodingers of that day. And the physics teacher put it this way. He said, having come from a family of physicists, having known many of the men whose names were legend in their times, I sometimes suggest that most of the practitioners whose attitudes and blindnesses you properly decry simply are not physicists at all, they are technicians. A Livermore scientist made the same point when he confessed, nuclear is a fact of life and my job is working to find ways to live with it. Workers do what they're told. The scientists at Los Alamos Labs complained when the S was removed from their badges, and they're no longer set apart from other workers. But there are other things they do not even notice that they might complain about because it's part of the control, part of the system of denial. Denial is very important to study today. The jargon used at defense labs at the Department of Defense itself includes such terms as, for those of you who are linguistically inclined, energetic disassemblies, you know what that is? That's a nuclear explosion. Alternative hostility, that's a nuclear war. Enmity stimulation, that's propaganda. Service, killed in action. Permanent pre-hostility is peace. And circadian deregulation is death. <laughs> it was the most bizarre experience. <coughs> Perhaps the most ubiquitous inequity in democratic societies has been the inability of those who will be affected by energy technologies to penetrate the secrecy, the jargon, the numerology in order to inform themselves of what's going on and to organize politically around the inequities that deal with life processes. We're caught in mind cages that inhibit planning for survival distinguishing between waging war or committing suicide or genocide, unable to imagine waging peace and unable to develop peace technology. Not a single U.S. defense research lab that's waging peace, although they tried at Los Alamos. Now I have a few more minutes. Scientific policymakers discuss the future in ways that reflect their inability to look at the present. Laboratory personnel project into the future the reality they cannot face in the present. And then they argue over future projections as if it were real. In 1985, there was a meeting, a symposium on nuclear winter held at the American Anthropology meetings. And after that, I went, there was invited to speak at Los Alamos. But there were physical scientists at that meeting who spoke about nuclear winter, about communities and families as if things would return to normal after a nuclear war. It was bizarre. I mean, I can't communicate. There's nothing I learned in Booga Booga that could compete with it. An advertisement for the book Nuclear Winter claimed that this book was an authoritative account of the consequences of nuclear war for humans and the environment. The first comprehensive description of the world after nuclear war that includes both effects on humans and the phenomena of nuclear winter. It's pseudoscience to ask how people would cope with nuclear winter. And people were writing about the fact that after the nuclear winter, it'll be easier to park, because there'll be fewer people. It's useful to examine the beliefs, the myths, myths about science as a way to decolonize our thinking about science. 
that the scientists themselves want us to do. I got a hundred letters from these, these people and phone calls. So they need help for all the reasons that I've stated. They can't dissent. And um, the scientific knowledge, we've just seen this film, Losing Knowledge, that has been destroyed in the name of progress. We have to think about that. The botanical science of the American Amazonian Indians, the agricultural know-how of the Mayan Indians, the drug know-how of people throughout the globe. People lived in different mountain desert zones and they survived because they solved their problem with ingenuity. They domesticated animals, they bred new plants, they built seaworthy vessels, and their philosophy had to be ecological because there were too few knowledge specialists. That's why we did naked science. So to understand what's happening in Western science, you have to understand the relationship in scientific research between the production of a research community, the production of scientists, the production of knowledge, the production of research equipment. Sometime after the development of the bomb, Robert Wilson, the physicist, said, our life was directed to do one thing. It was though we had been programmed to do that, and we are, as autonomous, we're doing it. Amazing how technology tools trap one. We all kept working because the machinery had caught us in their trap and we were anxious to get this thing to go off. Human frailty. Whenever there is need for legitimating science and technological positions, the concept of progress is utilized. Nuclear is still closed in technology as progress. And the presence rather than the consequence is the measure, in spite of things like Fukushima. The progress model silhouettes the benefit side of the technology. The hazard side takes the back seat. Enthusiasts claim the work must proceed without delay, hurry, hurry, because of the potential benefits for human life. Do potential benefits deserve the big risk that they take? The belief that science always moves forward, this is another Nobel laureate, represents a form of laissez-faire nonsense dismally reminiscent of the credo that American business, if left to itself, will solve everybody's problems. Just as the success of a corporate body in making money need not set the human condition ahead, neither does every scientific advance automatically make our lives more meaningful. So when people refer to the crisis in science today, they're referring to the fact that the faithful are beginning to think about the scientific endeavor in a more critical way. Those of you who take Science Magazine and read the, read the, the editorials, it's like 90% propaganda. We have to get people in science, why do people mathematics, they have to know mathematics to do science, and they have no idea what they're doing. They just are business as usual. If people are not interested in doing science, there may be some reasons for it some of which I've talked about here. Paul Feyerabend takes, uh, makes the observation that non-scientific ideologies, practices, theories, traditions can become powerful rivals and can reveal major shortcomings of science if they're given a fair chance to compete. And so people look at critical situations and I said, who, who got us out of that? Sometimes it's just plain joke, because he does the obvious thing. If you think your plane is going to be hijacked, you get up and you do something about it. You don't sit there. But if we all become automons, then the problems you know about, and I don't talk too well in the question period, result. Paul Feyerabend was controversial, because he takes the position that the superiority of Western science is not the result of comparisons of achievement, but the result of political, institutional, and military force. I taught a course last year, a seminar on science and power. A small number of people come to take such a seminar, but powerful. If you compare any other science tradition, now I know scientists, I know anthropologists that think there's only one science, European. Well, they might give credit to the Greeks. 
but it's European. What about Chinese science? What about Islamic science? Were any of them militarized like ours? Did any of them ever develop a technology that could destroy the planet? You know, you can evaluate your sciences on that basis. So, um, science is one ideology among many. Basically, what this leads me to think is that, to wind up, is that science needs just plain Joe and Jane. They need to be regulated by the generalists. Who is a generalist left in our society? The people who ask the common sense questions. That's why we argued for citizen participation. What's going on around here? That was a favorite question we asked at the National Institutes of Mental Health. And we couldn't get an answer from the bureaucrats. NASA funded recently a study that was headed, this is NSF money, industrial civilization headed for irresistible, ir irreversible collapse, question mark. How many of you saw that? Very interesting report. And they're talking about how the system could be unraveled. By investigating the human nature dynamics of past cases of collapse, which the archaeologists have done a beautiful job on, the project identifies the most salient interrelated factors which explain civilizational decline and determine the risk of collapse today, namely population, climate, water, agriculture, and energy. No inclusion of the experts and the power division. It's not just those people, population, client, every physicist I know said, what do you think the problems of the world are? Population problems. Yes, but what, how does that work? Now we say climate change. How does that involve experts and elites? These factors, as I say, can lead to collapse when they converge to generate two crucial social features. The stretching of resources due to strain placed on the ecological carrying capacity and the economic stratification of society into elites and masses of commoners, that is, the rich and the poor. Now, Occupy was about that. And Occupy was stimulated greatly by an anthropologist who used to teach in your department, David Craver. Accumulated surplus is not evenly distributed throughout society, controlled by an elite. The mass of population while producing the West wealth is only allocated a small portion of it by elites, usually just above subsistence. This is an amazing report that could have been written by an anthropologist. And maybe was, I don't know. It's written by a man named Ahmed. I don't know whether he's related to Akbar Ahmed, the, the anthropologist who is in the Ibn Khaldun chair in Washington, D.C. But what this shows is that human beings are vulnerable. The one thing, I keep saying to my students and my friends, the one th social science finding that nobody can refute, ever, is that human beings make mistakes. We know that. Human beings make mistakes. That's part of the component. Now, some people argue that it's because we still have a Paleolithic mind. You know, in the Paleolithic time, someone comes at you with a arrow, you get out of the way. But if somebody comes at you with radiation, you have no way of getting out of the way. You don't even see it. Latency period is too long. Maybe 10 or 15 years. How many of you read about the USS Reagan and the sailors on the USS Reagan? Anybody? 5,500 sailors went to help in the tsunami in Japan. They were not warned about radiation. They got there and there was a meltdown. They were in the water. They were washing themselves with uh, brushing their teeth, drinking the water that was radiated. And about three months later, they began to notice things. You know, dizzy, blocking out when they drive, and then can't walk, leukemia, breast problems, baby problems, the whole works. Within a month, within a three year period, there's a suit against the Japanese company, Kemco, by 155 American sailors. And the suit is being carried by two lawyers in San Francisco. And what that suit will point out is 
you have to have some skin in the game. You can't just experiment with humans and not be, not be responsible. You have to be held responsible by the law. And Temple has to be held responsible. They didn't sue the Navy because the Navy apparently didn't know that there had been a meltdown, but the company knew there had been a meltdown. So human frailty on all levels, and also human greed. And these are important issues for us to consider when we're talking about energy as a social and cultural problem. Energy is not a technological problem. It's a social and cultural problem. I'll just end on that and hope you have some questions and comments. Thank you. We have about 20, 25 minutes or so for questions, and I'll let you field your own okay. questions. Thank you for that. Um, this question about the militarization of science, it has come about incrementally. <coughs> so people didn't quite notice it. Like, I didn't know the NSF was started by the Defense Department. Sherry Washburn told me. It was for national security purposes. So uh, it came in slowly. And actually, my sister, who did her PhD on this stuff, of the militarization process. So even scientists didn't know where their money was going. So they were seduced, right? Departments are supposed to be free because when you're in a university, you're supposed to be not dependent necessarily on, uh, on these things. And there were independent people like Einstein, after all, he was working at a post office when he came up with his major findings. Like he was free. Those guys were free or they came from rich families, so they didn't need the money. The more you needed big technology, the more you needed money, the more you needed money, the more you had to go to Washington and or the corporate world. And it's really interesting. I, was, I invited a bunch of physicists to dinner about three months ago. And they were all senior physicists, big names from Lawrence Lab. And, you know, physicists can be boring too. So at one point in the conversation I said, what do you think physics should be like in 10 years? And one guy said, 10 years? Well, he was in the seven, late 70s. He said, bigger machines. And then somebody else, another physicist said, and more people to run the big machines. And then the wife looked at the, the senior guy, and she said, sounds like a factory to me. And she was right on. Now, the whole business of uh, egalitarian, an egalitarian approach that I, I use with these guys when I talk to them, infuriates them, but in a way it reveals them. So when I talk about militarization, all these things that I've talked about, I've never been screamed at except by a physical scientist, publicly. And the classic one was when I was giving a talk at Stanford. It was being videoed to, sent to Lawrence Berkeley, where my husband was, Livermore, Los Alamos, and of course at Stanford. And after I finished, this guy went berserk. He said, you're awful. You're awful. You, you, you didn't even show us any tables. There was no quantification. You talked to us like you talked to the next door neighbor. I said, you are the next door neighbor. There's a hubris. He thinks of himself as an elite. If he's an elite, I should have talked in his language, not my language. Quantify. We need less numbers, more pros. Right? So there's a, there's a, there's a, hierarchy that comes from militarization, and all the labs were started by the military, on a military model. And not all scientists are the same. That's why I got all those letters. They worry too. 
But they were happy that someone on the outside was saying this. Just turn it off. It's in the front, the first one. Anyway, um, I'm not used to a cell phone. I don't use it when I travel. Just turn it off. Uh, anyway, so, so it, it shows kind of the frustration of being treated like anybody else. And when I, I dedicated one of my books to the American taxpayer who was paid for science, American taxpayers have been very generous because I asked the scientists, I said, you know, I say things like, you've had millions of dollars, I have to hand it to you, because I saw some solarized, partly solarized building here. Millions of dollars to the Lawrence Berkeley lab. Not one solarized, not one solarized building, even at the lab. So I said, so where does your money come from? Congress. No, it comes from the American taxpayer. So I dedicated my book to the generous American taxpayer. Or the citizens of the young of the future who have no choice because it's being made for them. These are areas, I tell you, I like to study, I mean, I like the work that's being done now in anthropology on coal and oil and so forth, but just keep on going up and see what it's about. You're studying coal, you're going to hit the companies. Look what's happening in West Virginia. Look what's happening with Duke Energy, right? And come, take in the whole picture. Don't just look at the coal and the workers and the, the downtrodden. Take it all away. Study up, down, and sideways. So, thank you. First, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for this great talk, first of all. I just wanted to know your, you know, your perspective on how these great insights and further, you know, this information on elite anthropology can be, um, you know, can be used to, further used to uh, influence these institutions, and how can we apply this, you know, information that and. This insights that we're getting just go public. See, what was interesting is somebody did a biography of a you know, a kind of a history of the Conaeus Project, this National Academy of Sciences, and he wanted to interview me. I said, Why do you want to interview me? He said, Because you changed the subject. I said, I was just one person. It was a pile like this of material, right? And when it came to my uh, energy in a democratic society, they did not want to publish it. They kept saying more pro, you know, and then finally the way I got it published was to say either you're ignorant or you're dishonest. Take your choice, I'm going to publish this, and if you don't publish it, I'll go to the press. So I had to basically threaten them. I was at the Wilson Center at the time in Washington. This, I mean, there comes a time when you just have to say, look, science is about truth. See, when I gave a talk in Los Alamos, what they really were it was just talk called Barriers to Thinking New. Why did I call it that? Because that's what they care about. They care about novelty, new ideas, creativity, right? Barriers to Thinking New. What? You think science has barriers to thinking new? Look at the Nobel laureate says that is, you can't say that today. So you have inside help. And if you say it, they can quote you. I mean, I was just one person. It was very frustrating. It was the hardest field work I ever did, but it was probably the most important. Not as much fun as being with the Zopotec and the music and, you know, yeah. stuff. But it was like, I would come in the house from those meetings and I'd hit head for the shower. I felt dirty. How can you talk about 2% of the population? You lose 2% of the population? You have no skin in the game, that's why you can say that. You're not going to be responsible, you're not going to be held responsible. So in terms of, you don't have to apply anthropology, you have to go public in some way. I mean, look at Dick, David Graeber's Dick book. He probably, at the year he published that, most famous anthropologist in the world. Not to anthropologists, but to everybody else. Why? He hit it, he hit it. Everybody's worried about Dick. Countries are worried, individuals are worried, right? And he writes about 5,000 years of debt or whatever the title was. And so you have to sort of listen to the public and see what, you know, what, what are they ready to have. But you have to be, you know, whatever. Now, sometimes you just do it. Del Himes was asked to do reinventing anthropology in the 60s. And he asked me to write a paper. 
I am not an ist. I keep saying that because people always say, are you a Marxist? Are you a I'm not an ist. I'm not a Foucauldian. I'm not a Gramscian. I use Foucault. I use Gramsci, depending on the question. But I'm not an ist, right? So I wrote this in kind of total innocence. I didn't even have, I didn't even know the double entendre of the anthropologist. Because there had been a book called Up the Organization. So I sort of copied that. But, and people sort of laughed about the title of the poem. It had a huge impact. I was just, I was an assistant professor when I wrote it. I had no idea. People in my department didn't even read it for 10 years after, so they were so offended. <laughs> and now they call, you know, the swimming upstream and they have various ways of talking about it and so on. But anthropologists didn't study power. How can you study coal or oil or anything without studying power? Susanna Sawyer, she happens to be the daughter of a, of a, of a CEO. So to her it wasn't you know, a big issue. And many of these scientists that wrote me were all from rich families. So they weren't so scared I'm going to lose my job and so on. Goffman wasn't scared because he was also a medical doctor and he had tenure at Berkeley. But that is not free science. So my question, when is science scientific? I'm not saying I'm against science. I'm saying I'm for good science. And in Up the Anthropologist, I did the same thing. I said for our work to be scientific, we can't just draw the line around the colonized. We have to include the colonizers, for example. You can't just understand the ghetto without understanding the banks redlining. So you just push the question out. People are really grateful. I mean, these guys were grateful. Are they always grateful? No. I say to my students, you can't want to be loved and do this kind of work. But how many people feel good about being said, you're awful, you're awful. My husband's standing at the lab laughing his head off. I thought it was funny. The guy lost his temper. And only th and physicists lose their temper. Because they think they're special and so on. So, but it, when it was published in the Industrial Physicist, you should read the comments that those guys were in. Those are mainly engineers. And it was a geology professor that suggested they republish various to think he knew about energy. He said it's as good now as it was 40 years ago. So they published it, a version of it. And then the guys, the engineers, started writing. We don't need some pinko Berkeley professor to, you know, you should. It was funny. But I had to answer. And I still so I had to explain anthropology and the long durée perspective. Right? To them. So you don't answer by getting defensive. You answer like, you know, it's a question from uh, Anthro 3 class. Someone asks a racist question, Anthro 3, you don't say, you dumbbell. You know, you say, you explain it to them. You have to know how to talk. And you have to talk English. I think the worst thing that's happened in our field is jargon. We used to be the best. We used to be the best writers. When, when I got my PhD, anthropology was peak. People could understand. Up the and you read *Mirror for Man* by Cluckhorn was a bestseller. And he has a chapter. And anthropologist looks at the United States. And anthropologist looks at the world. He had scope. He said anthropology had possibility. Then we went into this whole period: damning anthropology, navel gazing. You know, we didn't study the colonizers, calling them wrong, anthropology is all a bunch of whatever. It's like any other field. Not some good things, it's like physics. Not some problems and so on. But you don't just make a living damning the field, you're in. <laughs> you know. now, and thinking it's all about social philosophy. And thinking you've got theory. That was what's interesting. They started damning ethnography. <coughs> just description. We want theory, theory in anthropology. So I, I thought, you know, I didn't get it. So I looked up the word theory in the dictionary. because Somehow it didn't click. And theory either describes or explains, according to Webster. Right? And philosophy is conceptual. So they were going to the European philosophers for theory, but they were getting conceptual material. And then they became a Foucauldian, or whatever, whatever they became, you know, into anthropology. And then the words, 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 words. And it's like con artists. I'm telling you, there's some, there's some linguist at the University of Chicago, whose name I won't refer to, but he talks like a con artist. 
He insists that what he says is so important you should work hard to understand what he says. Who's got time? You know? I mean, I'll give you the first lesson I learned about Jeremy. Talco Parsons. You know who he is? All right, sociologist. Talco Parsons gave the first talk I went to at Harvard. He talked for an hour and did not understand what the subject was. Right? And I thought, I'm dumb. What am I, you know, I can't even understand what the subject matter was. Then, um, what's his name? A sociologist. How can I forget? C. Rack Mills? No, you see, he was at Columbia. No, the sociologist at Harvard who never got a PhD, but he was a professor of sociology. How can I forget his name? The human group. Anyways, he got up and he said, Talcott, are you saying that the more people get to know each other, the more they like each other? Talcott said, yes. And Holmans, it was Holmans. Holmans sat down. And I thought, that was the last time anybody's going to pull the wool over my eyes. <laughs> Can you believe? It's the same with a lot that's happening in our field. We used to be the books that everybody bought. Malinowski wrote for the scientists, the public, Man of Science and Religion. He was conscious of that. You write books, people buy them. So, we've, in a way, we've lost our way at a time when we're desperately needed. <clears throat> the generalist anthropology is desperately needed. But we have a role to play. Can I tell him a joke? Sure. It's about Talca Parsons' joke. <laughs> <laughs> there are a bunch of psychiatrists and they had a, a meeting in California. And they sort of got the thing mixed up. They were supposed to go to a psychiatric hospital. California, modern something like California. And then they were going to go to the Center for Advanced Study. But they got it mixed up. So they went to the center thinking it was a psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. And this pudgy guy was walking across the lawn. And so one of the psychiatrists said, And who are you? He said, I'm Talcott Parsons. And the guy says to the other psychiatrist, Dig that, he thinks he's Talcott Parsons. <laughs> 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 Any other questions you want to ask? Yeah. Um, you're very critical of scientists and probably rightly so, but I'm just wondering if you can give us a bit more texture to the different kinds of scientists and sort of ethnographic subjects who you encounter. And I'm wondering particularly if you have found people who actually want to take up the kind of ethnological approach that you're promoting and you know, say resistance within the ranks and how um, the, those kinds of um, encounters Sharon that you Charlie, have. Hugh Gustafson come to mind. Mm -hmm. um, all the people that wrote me letters for science. Yeah. They were Nobel laureates, they were heads of the laboratory. There were no students that wrote. It was all big guys. So they're worried about creativity. They're worried about ethics. They're worried about thinking science is everything. So within, that's why I say, within the science community, there's huge diversity. But then there's the power structure. The people, in this case, the military. And so I guess the question is that how, what kind of, um, you know, pragmatically speaking, what kind of support or, um, you know, kind of solidarity can be built with people who are within those ranks who are trying to engineer change? Because I know you know, from personal experience that they're very much there. So then the question is, you know, what, what can an anthropologist do then? Um, or how have you pursued those um, kinds of relationships well, further? You might look, take a look at Naked Science, the chapter on the three-cornered constellation, Magic Science and Religion. Um, and if you look at Hugh Gusterson's work, I, in a way, I feel that I've helped the younger scientists who want to do this kind of work, like Hugh studied uh, Livermore. And he didn't have cover, so he had to go in, and he couldn't get access, so he had to do it with the bars and the, and the churches and so forth on the weekend. He had a very hard time getting his book published. But that's where I came. So, you know, I reviewed and I said, well, I should be published and so on. Sharon Trauman comes. They're both Stanford students, but nobody at Stanford was doing this kind of work. So I they used to be sent they used to send them to me. And so I would I would call that mentoring, mentoring the younger faculty. 
And, and of course, uh, when I teach a course called This Course, Science and Power, I get a lot of this small course, but interesting people, mainly medical doctors, mm -hmm. who, who want to know about science and power. They're interested in pharmaceuticals, and they're interested in uh, improving the delivery of science, they're interested in just too much technology in medicine, things like that. But little by little, it's not a, you know, if you had said to me 50 years ago you're going to be studying energy, you're going to be involved with scientists, oh, it's serendipitous. Right? But my rock, my rock was the anthropology of law. So in effect, in effect, I guess I'm saying that if you have a rock, something that you make your reputation on, your ethnographic, you know, your first ethnographic work and so on, that gives you freedom to do all kinds of things. So I go into the gender field, and follow your curiosity and do things that you want. I mean, this book that I just published, uh, called Culture and Dignity, uh, you have to educate the people that are reading it, uh, reviewing it. Uh, I mean, like they said things like, why dignity? I mean, they had a title for my book, like uh, uh, Political, Historical, and Blah, Blah, Blah in the Middle East. Who wants to read that? Really? Culture and dignity. Why culture and why dignity? Everybody's talking about dignity. They didn't know it. The marketing people didn't know it either, apparently. The marketing people are the worst. Because you can get your book published and the marketing people say, you know, you should do this. And do. They kept sending me camels and pictures for the cover, you know. <laughs> the whole notion of what the Middle East was, they're foolish. So, but you have to educate them at every step of the way. <coughs> You have to educate the, the bureaucracy in your universities, too. It's a great time to be an anthropologist. <laughs> There's never been, in my time, a better time to be an anthropologist. Got nothing to lose. And lots of issues, very important. And if you don't have any jobs, you can do whatever you want, right? On, <laughs> Whatever you can, wherever you can, but don't just sit in despair. It's really, you know, it's a wonderful time for anthropologists. There's a, there's a, a huge gap. We're more ethnocentric in this country now than when I was in graduate school. American exceptionalism. Ignorance. Our president doesn't even know the relationship between Crimea and Russia. Ignorance at the top. Hillary Clinton. Everywhere she goes, you know she's. You didn't treat your women that way. She doesn't know how women are treated in the United States. We've got a bunch of congressmen that are telling women how to, how to use their bodies. It's so insulting, 2014. And there's a feminist movement, supposedly. A bunch of congressmen at the local level, the state level, and the federal level are telling women what to do with their bodies. And when my I tried to explain the abortion issue to my mother, at 95, she sat up in her chair and she said, not their business. When did it become the business of the state? You see how one thing leads to another? In the latter part of the 19th century. It wasn't their business. Homosexuality wasn't the business of the state either. Until recently. Now how does that happen? So the ingredient you need is indignation and curiosity. And then the talents that you're given in graduate school. The training, the training. Great time to be an asshole. <laughs> yeah. From some, to some degree, I do agree that it's a great time to be an anthropologist. Um, and then in other ways, I think it's sort of a precarious time to be an anthropologist because of questions of like funding. And like ever since I took your classes at Berkeley, it seems like questions of like area study and like geographic. Um, like area sites is sort of like the fashion, the way that you are sort of like inculcated into becoming a professional. You need to be associated with some place over there as opposed to like, um, you know, just studying up. So I guess my question to you is like, um, in regards to historical memory, because you've, I mean, institutional memory, because you've been at Berkeley for so long, what are sort of like the barriers to thinking up? in terms of like the discipline of anthropology. Well, if you have a rock, something that's acceptable in the field, like studying the anthropology of law, then you can do anything you want, basically. 
So I kept on, and, I, and all my public pieces I never showed to anybody and, until I came up for, for full professorship. And, and uh, Alan Dundies came into my office and said, I want it all. Give me all of it. But you know, you guys think there's no money. I went to do my first field work on $1,200 from the Mexican government. The American government was putting all this money into Africa at that time. But I wanted to go to Mexico. So I went to Mexico. I could have said, oh, I'll go to Africa, that's where the money is. I wanted to go to Mexico. I wanted to go to Oaxaca. There was a blank on the map. I wanted to see what was there. So you have to sort of be self-driven in a way. And uh, I got a letter from a student the day before I came, and she said, I'm in despair. I've been looking for a job for two years now. She just got her PhD in 2013. I said, it's too early to be in despair. Start writing. Do something. So I think that anthropologists have more money today than we ever have. And more post there were no postdocs when I was coming up. But there was passion. It wasn't a career, it was passion. And part of it I learned from the veterans. Because when I was in graduate school, is when the veterans all came back to graduate school. And they had all been in the Philippines, like Al Conklin and so they all came back to study anthropology. And to them, they were passionate. Not a career, passion. I, I love the field. Why? Because it's wide open. You can follow your curiosity wherever. Who would have said I'd be in energy? Who would have said I'd be writing about gender? You know, I get mad at what the idiocy I read in the feminist literature, so it makes me write a, write a piece, right? <laughs> and the area courses, they gave me so much trouble with this book on, on the subtitle, the dialogues between the Middle East and the West, the area people didn't know what to do with it. How are you going to use that in an anthropology of the Middle East? And so I wrote a piece on area studies. They're military. It's a military term. And I published it in the anthropology newsletter. It didn't have to be too long, and they take things and write, and write things for them. And uh, it got a lot of hits, a lot of response, because a lot of people were thinking that, but they weren't writing about it. You're lucky. You're lucky to be in a department that supports and so on, and you're very lucky. Go thou far and raise hell. Hi, I, I have two questions. One of them is regarding energy policy and citizen participation. How, how do you think, what, what, what do you think would be appropriate to get more citizens to participate in energy policy and draft energy policy and then order active voice to their opinions on this? Because I think that's what you said. It was like a, there was a linkage break between those two. And then I, my second question would be, um, what do you think about the women in, phys in physics that, if there were women at all, in the committees that you were in? And currently, what do you think about women who are in physics? And well, how well, let me answer physics? that first, and then I'll take the first one. I think it has nothing to do with your... We used to think that if there are more women, things would be different. We're not. We've gone from thinking that women have... We've destroyed women's culture. We've merged women's culture with men's culture in the United States. So we used to talk about women making peace. But what happened? Women are now fighting to be in the war on the front. Are you kidding? They're getting raped and the feminists are not doing anything about it. They should be raising hell in this country. Where are they asleep? They think they won the woman's war. So one of the things we've learned is if you're black, it doesn't mean you can't be corrupt and dumb. And if you're just like the white men, it's character. It's not gender or race or color. But we keep thinking like if we only had a black president, everybody voted. I said, you're a bunch of racists. If you vote for Obama because he's black, you're racist. Period. If you vote for Hillary Clinton because she's a woman, you're a sexist. I don't care whether you're women or men. Who cares? At this point, this is critical in our, in our society. This is a really critical time for democracy. We're barely a democracy. I just talked to a couple of young people, one of whom I knew when they were kids. One left for New Zealand, because she, for Australia, because she thinks this is a police state. And the other one has gone into philanthropy, because she wants to do, do good. You know, she wants to improve things. On the question of how to get people interested in 
the people you should get are the faculty, are the universities. Civic involvement at the, at the university level. We're asleep. And I, when I gave my talk on energy in my hometown in Winston, it was amazing. All these people showed up, they were solarizing their houses, they were doing all these things. We are a bunch of elitists and we should get off of that. I got a call from a woman who says she's related to me, some distant relative, etc. She said, I'm now in public health and I need your advice. I'm going to go help the booga booga do such and such. What, what would you have to advise me? I hope you could advise me. First, you're not going to help them at all. You're going to go and learn from them. The idea that I'm going to go help, the humanitarian impulse, is very sick. It's not a good thing. If it's mutual, it'll work. It's not mutual. It's false. And it becomes a, a pre, uh, it becomes an avenue for imperialism. So, you have to have mutual respect. Mutual respect. So the guy that said, you're awful to me, I didn't recognize him as an elite. That's why he was so mad at me. He's just like anybody else. He said, you talk to me like I was the next door neighbor. Yes, you are the next door neighbor. And that's the way we should be talking to each other, mutual respect. You know something I don't know, I know something you don't know. Honestly, I don't know what other direction to go in on these issues. The solar movement is bottom up. It's a lot, and a lot of kids are in this in California and so on, and they're doing experiments. And, you know, in my energy reader, the energy reader, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but I have a bunch of action pieces. They're doing it. The Native Americans are doing it. They're not just complaining. They're out there doing solar, doing all of the alternative conservation efficiency and so on. And the just plain folks are doing it. So we can learn from them and we can say, oh, hey, maybe you should do it this way. The thing that boggles your mind is, I mean, just think of this. We can go to the moon, but we can't find out what happened to the Malaysian plane. I just can't believe that. We have the technology to go to the moon. We can't solve the simple problems we have. How can that be? I went around saying, how can that be? How can that be? We can talk about solar, millions of dollars, tax, tax money at the lab, no solar. Thank you. Yes. You, you just asked, how, how can that be? And I think what's happened is that the deliberative process in society has really broken down. It's not working. Right. And if we're going to be able to solve these problems, we're going to have to restore and improve that deliberative process. And you know, the question uh, also was, how do you do that? You encourage debate. I don't mean screaming. I mean debate. You should be. You should say, I don't agree with you for the following reasons. And I say, well, well how much evidence do you have? Tell me your evidence. And I say, I'll argue with that. Debate. You can't. There's no debate today. I mean, that's what Governor Brown was talking about. I'm, called me up one day and said, what is it? You can't talk to anybody. Everything is PC. That's a controlling process, PC. You have to be nice. The niceness of it is. You have to be nice. So deliberative. Now some people, I mean, some people I know in Washington are having debates on taboos, things that you can't talk about. Then they have them regularly. But these, these should be happening in every community. You're right. What happened to, what happened to, I mean, how many articles have been written about what's happened to the progressives in our country? Okay. People will say it's a weak democracy, or it's no democracy, or we're losing democracy, secrecy and all the rest. I was telling Chris and some others, the most interesting thing about, interesting thing about Snowden is he never went to college. And Steve Hawking never went to college. What does that say about what we're getting in education and college? Are we being taught to critically think? I, I would say no. <laughs> Any time. Yeah. So thank you all for coming. Um, we're out of time now. Um, Chris, I, would you say there were refreshments, or is that for after, or? We just have a little bit of tea and coffee. Okay, so we have tea and coffee if those would like to linger and have conversation. Um, but thank you all for coming, and thank you especially uh, Professor Nader for his talk.